Good morning, and welcome to Stony Creek United Methodist Church. Uh, we're a small church out in Augusta Township, but we're mighty. And that will we'll show you that we're mighty when I get done with all the announcements. <laughs> no, seriously. Um, it's the time of the year that we have a chance to show our appreciation to our staff. So there's a little white church out in the narthex, and we'll be honoring Pastor Michael. Uh, Tammy and Katie are two choir directors, and Rich and Teresa are choir director and sound technician. So if you'd like to honor these people, you can put your donation in the church, or you can put it in your offering plate. If you put it in the offering plate, make sure that you denote it's for staff Christmas. <clears throat> um, you will all have an opportunity to help decorate and add to the decorations that are now on display in the church. Uh, if you would like to buy a poinsettia, they're $20 each. Um, we have order forms, or if you call into the church number and indicate you'd like to have someone contact you, then someone will contact you. And you can just display them or you can make them in honor or in memory of somebody. The poinsettias will be here next Sunday, the 17th, and then they'll also be on display Christmas Eve morning when we will have our usual service at 1045, and they will be on display that evening when the Christmas Eve service will be here in the sanctuary and will also be broadcast. Um, the sound technician and I made an executive decision, so it will be broadcast over the uh, internet uh, also that evening. Uh, Want to continue to bring forth um, if you'd like to worship and have Bible study in person, you're all welcome to come here to the church on Mondays at 10 o'clock when Dave Monson leads Bible study. And then there are flyers uh, announcing how to get into the Advent Bible study. This is a separate one being run by the pastor and you can contact him. Uh, it runs on, it looks like it's Wednesdays, so it'll be broadcast this week on the 13th, and you have two opportunities, 10.30 to 11.30, or 8 o'clock at night to 9 o'clock at night. So contact the pastor if you need more details on that. Um, I'm also wanting to bring to your attention that Stony Creek has a daily devotional. It's called the Upper Room. People here in the congregation can pick theirs up. We get them both in large print and in the smaller print. And if any of you out there in cyberspace would like one, again, contact the pastor. He will let me know and I'll make sure that you get your copy of the daily devotional. The first one will run for the months of January through February of 24. Um, Oh, Advent letters were mailed out this week, so some of you may have gotten them. Uh, I haven't gotten mine yet, but U.S. Postal Service is sometimes kind of slow. So that will further explain that 
the uh, poinsettias that you purchase, the profit from those go to support the ministry of Jill Hall, and the uh, Christmas offering will go to Bishop's School this year. And there's also going to be a pledge card. If you're willing to fill it out and return it, that will give uh, the treasurer and the executive board a better idea of how to budget for next year. Okay, I'm just kind of, <laughs> I was sharing with someone this morning that my husband used to say, I think your church has more announcements than it does worship, but that's not true. We are now at a point where um, we are going to turn it over to the praise band and their staff. Uh, and I see a finger. We have one more announcement. I just want to say that I'm on, I'm on my way to change the beginning of church because I'm an old people and don't tell me you folks are too young for this. I like starting on the hour. It's easier to remember. I don't have to worry about if I'm here at a quarter to or 10 to or 22 or whatever. So if anybody wants to join the herd, we want to start church on the hour. I don't care what hour it is, just on the hour. Thank you. Okay. Are there any other announcements? I didn't mean to slide anybody. Okay. At this point, I do turn it over to Teresa and Katie and our praise band to begin our hour of worship at Stony Creek. Thank you. And now we have two songs to offer this morning, and you may remain seated. My soul praises the Lord. My heart rejoices in God my Savior, because the powerful one has done great things for me. Let us praise the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come to help his people and has given them freedom. He has given us a powerful Savior from the family of God's servant David. Through his holy prophets of long ago, he had promised to do this. With the loving mercy of our God, a new day from heaven will dawn upon us.
At that time, Augustus Caesar sent an order to all people in the countries under Roman rule that they must list their names in a register, and all went to their own towns to be registered. So Joseph left Nazareth, a town in Galilee, and went to the town of Bethlehem in Judea, known as the town of David. Joseph went there because he was from the family of David. Joseph registered with Mary, to whom he was engaged, and who was now pregnant. While they were in Bethlehem, the time came for Mary to have the baby, and she gave birth to her first son. Because there were no rooms left in the inn, she wrapped the baby with pieces of cloth and laid him in a box where animals are fed. What a great way to start our worship this morning. And thank you to Katie and Chris for their part in the duet. At this time, I invite you to turn to your Advent reflection. This is the second Sunday. And I invite Ken and Belinda Hussey to come forth they're going to be leading us in our Advent presentation. Thank you. Good morning. Um, we were hoping to have our grandchildren here, but out of all of the four that would have been here, half of them have been sick off and on all week. So we're on our own. Um, rejoice always, pray without ceasing. We give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus. Our scripture lesson is from Psalm 85, verses 1 through 2, and verses 8 through 13. And that would be on page 584 and 585 in our Pew Bibles. You, Lord, showed favor to your land. You restored the fortunes of Jacob. You forgave the iniquity of your people and covered all their sins. 
I will listen to what God the Lord says. He promises peace to his people, his faithful servants, but let them not turn to folly. Surely his salvation is near, those who fear him, that his glory may dwell in our land. Love and faithfulness meet together. Righteousness and peace kiss each other. Faithfulness springs forth from the earth and righteousness looks down from heaven. The Lord will indeed give what is good and our land will yield its harvest. Righteousness goes before him and prepares the way for his steps. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Every day, many weary children of God journey from all corners of this vast earth, leaving behind their homes and countries ravaged by war, disease, poverty, and injustice. Each is looking for the place where righteousness and peace will kiss each other. Children ride La Bestia, and that's a freight train, from the depths of gang-controlled Honduras to the edges of the United States with hope for lives outside the reach of Maras. And Maras is another word for gangs. Women, will, women with malnourished babies endure years in Kenyan refugee camps with hope for health and sus sustenance. Families in the United States tremble in the shadows fearful of the moment the deportation officers come to take someone from the home. This Advent season, listen, God's voice is speaking peace to each of those who are faithful. Listen, we are the ones called by God, be partners together in steadfast love. O oh God, illuminate the way for migrants on the journey from war, from disease, from poverty, from injustice. Let justice march out in front, making the path that we may follow. Help us to welcome and serve the neighbors in our midst, the newly arrived and the deeply rooted. Let justice march out in front, making the path that we may follow. We believe in a God who speaks peace to all peoples. We pray for the day when no child or adult is forced to leave their home <clears throat> in search of peace, health, safety, or justice. Our hope is for the day we can walk together neighbor with neighbor. Let justice march out from heart, making the path that we may follow. this time we come to the place in our worship where we give back to God what God gave us. And we thank you, God, for another chance for us to meet together in your house and to worship you. Father, we pray that all offerings given today come out of love. We experience your blessings every day, and your blessings are always given to us freely and with love. You loved us all the way to the cross. May we love you enough to give you what is already yours. 
Bless these tithes and offerings today. We love you. Amen. At this time, the ushers will come forward. Uh, just a short reminder, if you have envelopes to include, you can put them in the offering plate. Uh, if they're specifically for the staff, you can drop it in the church afterwards. Thank you. I think, oh, that was fantastic. I started moving, and I noticed that even our offering people were moving, so that's what we do at Stony Creek. We, we're serious, but we, we Christians like to show how we believe. Uh, at this time, I welcome the offering to come to the fourth. All of you that are able, if you'd like to stand and sing from page 95, our doxology. thank you today for your blessings that you bestow, bestow upon us. Lord, may we all give with gladness and sincerity. Bless these tithes and offerings. We love you, Father. Amen. You may be seated, and while we're waiting for Pastor Michael to bring us our greeting, I want to remind everyone the attendance pads are towards the aisle side, and if you will sign in, pass them down, and then pass them back, they'll be collected. This gives us an idea of who's here, and it also can give you an opportunity 
to update an address, maybe you've moved, uh, some information that needs to get to the appropriate people. Thank you and welcome Pastor Michael. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome again to Stony Creek United Methodist Church. I am Pastor Michael. I'm very happy to see you all here on the second Sunday of Advent. I want to remind you all that you are beloved children of God. You are made in the image of God, and that means you are perfect and beautiful just the way you are. God loves us unconditionally, and there's nothing we can ever do to escape that perfect love or grace. Um, as we are in our second week of Advent, um, I want us to keep in mind what this season is all about. Um, it's a season of anticipation. We're waiting for the coming birth of our Savior, and we're going to touch on some of that a little bit later in the service, but I'd like to invite our children and youth to come hang out with me for a few minutes. How you guys doing? Yeah. <clears throat> Everybody awake? Yeah. No. I see you finally have your chair. I do. Wow, that's a big compliment. Last year, me and my friend Carly, we were trying to get him to get it. All right. So, I have a lot to tell you guys about this morning. Yeah. A whole lot. Do you guys remember what we're doing this month? What season is it? Oh, winter. Winter. It's, it's, um, when, I opened my mouth no, up. No, it's Christmas season. It's Advent and Christmas season. It's season. Yes, that's true. And also Hanukkah. Yeah. So, I want yeah. you guys to tell me, what do you like about celebrating Christmas? What do you like about it? Eating all the food. <laughs> Presents and loving. Presents and loving. Toys. Toys. <laughs> yeah. Shrek. Shrek. Fair <laughs> enough. All right. I want to read you guys a story called what? Cookie. Cookie. Okay. I want to read you a story called Joseph's Joy. And I want you to look. Who do you think, which one do you think is Joseph? Uh, sleeping. That's right, sleeping, that's Joseph. Okay? So, there was a man named Joseph whose family lived in Bethlehem. Joseph came from the family of King David. Joseph was engaged to marry a woman named Mary. Joseph learned that Mary was going to have a baby. Joseph had a dream. In the dream, he saw an angel of God the angel said, Joseph, the baby that Mary is having is God's gift to the whole world. Marry her and name the baby Jesus. When he woke up, Joseph married Mary, and when Mary gave birth to a son, Joseph named the baby Jesus. So do you guys think Joseph had any other dreams like that? Walking up the stairs to Jesus. That, that was last week. This is Joseph. Oh, so we, we don't know. It's not recorded anywhere in Scripture if he had other dreams like that, but he might have. All right, I also want to read you another story called Mary's Joy. Now, I'm pretty sure you can guess which one's Mary. But do you notice this person? They look a lot like the other one who was with Joseph, doesn't, don't they? So Mary lived in the town of Nazareth. Mary was engaged to marry Joseph, a builder whose family lived in Bethlehem. One day an angel appeared to Mary. At first, Mary was scared. 
But the angel Gabriel spoke to her, saying, Don't be afraid, Mary. God is pleased with you. I have come to tell you good news. God is going to send you a baby boy. You will name him Jesus. He is God's son. He will show everyone how to love God and each other. Mary listened closely, and her heart was filled with joy. I am a servant of God. I will do what God wants me to do, Mary said. So I wonder, what makes you joyful? What makes you joyful? Being happy. Okay. Sometimes when my family gives me a hug, and uh, when I get like, when my parents want me to have like special dinner or lunch, or like we get to go somewhere to get toys. Okay. Basically everything except for bad stuff. Okay. What makes you joyful? Shrek. Shrek. <laughs> Reoccurring theme. What about you? What makes you joyful? Getting hugs from people when you're happy. Okay. Last one. Yeah, I don't, I'm not buying that. Nice try. All right. Can you guys help me with something and do a repeat after me prayer? No. All right. Ready? Dear God, thank you for the joy of Advent and for the Bible stories of the Advent season. Amen. Awesome. Thank you guys. Oh, we got one more thing to do. I almost forgot. The Lord's Prayer. That's right. You ready? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, and trespass against us, and lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Awesome. Thank you guys for coming up and hanging out with me. If you want a sucker, you can have one. And then I think it's time for kids club in Sunday still, school. Is there still blue raspberry? Yeah. I have no idea. Wait, mystery might have its blue yeah. Mystery has a chance of having blue raspberry. That's true. Mom, go. I like this one the most. I really want a mystery that has blue. Hopefully. Stop all the You could get a sucker too. So you pass the time and also help your throat. That's getting croaky. Okay. Okay, come on. Okay. While all of those carefully chosen suckers got picked, I invite those of you to turn to page 211 in our Methodist hymnal. Stand if you are able. If not, just sing out real loud. Page 211, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel.
Please be seated. Now is the time that we bring before God and God's people the things that weigh upon our hearts and our minds, as well as those that give us cause for celebration. Do we have any joys or concerns we'd like to lift up this morning? I have a joy that the Monday morning Bible study group has been meeting for almost three years now. And we just completed the book of Ezekiel, which is 48 chapters. And we're going to take a break until January 8th, when we're going to start the book of Daniel. So all are invited. We meet at 10 o'clock on Monday mornings. Thank you. Jim's daughter, Harley Logan, is going through an intensive EMT class at Huron Valley, and she has some tests coming up, uh, the state board and the other tests, and she's only 23. So if we can have some encouraging prayers that she makes it through her finals and goes on to be an EMT. What was her first name again? I'm sorry. Harley. Harley. Before we uh, quit this here right now, I think uh, we ought to give a few people a big roar of uh, fun and get together. Uh, Teresa and Rich were the ones that have that beautiful Christmas tree up there. They do it every year, and they need to get a big round of applause for that. And also the music, I'm about wore out, but <laughs> Everybody else is doing well, uh, and uh, we really appreciate uh, everything that Teresa does in the music line, and also Tammy, and uh, just uh, a beautiful Merry Christmas we already got started. Thank you. Uh, if you will allow it, uh, a proud mom and a proud grandma to brag, uh, some of you have heard about my grandson, Zachary, and Zachary's at Kalamazoo College, and he made the dean's list with a perfect four point. So I'm very proud of him. And the not to be outdone, Zachary's dad, who's swim coach for Milan, was voted by all of the swim coaches in the state of Michigan, Division Three, and Daniel is the state swim coach for the girls' season in Michigan. So I am very proud of him. Uh, but I need to tone it down and also ask for continued prayers for two of my little care bears, Linda Ishmael and Joyce Hannon, uh, they both are still at home, uh, having recently been in hospital visits. And so just keep them and your prayers and thoughts. Thank you. If you would please uh, grab one of the Faith We Sing hymnals and turn to number 2071, Jesus' name above all names for our invitation to prayer. If you would please join me again in an attitude of prayer. 
As heralds of God's good tidings, let us lift up our voices with strength this day, praying to the one who comforts, restores, and heals. Let us pray for all leaders and people of the world. You have created one human family to live in righteousness and peace. Give us the wisdom to order our common life according to your loving purposes, that your glory may be revealed and all people shall see it together. Let us pray for your church. You have given us the gift of the Messiah so that your church may be steadfast and true. Give us strength to follow your son into all, until all have come to repentance and are reconciled by his love. Let us pray for those who are sick, who suffer need, who are exiled or in danger. We especially lift up Linda and Joyce. You have made us for a holy purpose to comfort and care for each other. Give us compassion to love our neighbor and patience to care for those in need. Let us pray for those who are facing stressful and challenging situations. We lift up Harley as she will begin finals and other tests in her journey to become an EMT. We pray that you would give her patience, let her have rest as she needs it, help her to become what you would have her be, let her take that journey to be one who cares for others. Let us pray for all of the amazing blessings you bestow upon us in our lives. We give you thanks for a Monday morning Bible study group who continues to meet for over three years, continues to work to study and learn your word. We give thanks for Zachary and his amazing and dedicated work while he is at college making the dean's list and having a perfect 4.0. We also give thanks for Daniel, his father, who has been voted the best swim coach in Michigan, showing not only his hard work and dedication, but also his love for those who he coaches and works with. Let us pray for your creation. Your faithfulness springs up from the ground and your goodness looks down from the sky. Rid us of the laziness and greed that diminish life as you teach us to care for your creation together. Let us remember those who have died. Ever living God, one day in your presence is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like one day. Make us one with the saints who have found their eternal home in you, creator God, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. And if you would please join with me in our prayer for illumination. Mighty God, send your Holy Spirit to speak peace that the good news of this age may be proclaimed through your word, which stands forever. Amen. Our first scripture reading this morning is in the New Testament in the book of Mark. Uh, and Mark, throughout his uh, book, explains how the Messiah is in motion. He tells about how he teaches, he heals, he serves, he saves, he preaches and he feeds the multitude. It's also part going into Advent and waiting and how we have the promise that something's going to come. And that message is brought by John the Baptist this morning as he prepares the way. 
This is the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. It begins just as the prophet Isaiah had written. And Isaiah says, look, I am sending my messenger ahead of you, and he will prepare your way. He is a voice shouting in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord's coming, clear the road for him. This messenger was John the Baptist. He was in the wilderness and preached that people should be baptized to show that they had repented of their sins and turned to God to be forgiven. All of Judea, including all the people of Jerusalem, went out to see and hear this John. And when they confessed their sins, John baptized them in the Jordan River. John's clothes were woven from coarse camel hair, and he wore a leather belt around his waist. For food, he ate locusts and wild honey. John announced, Someone is coming soon who is greater than I am, so much greater that I'm not even worthy to stoop down like a slave and untie the straps of his sandals. John says, I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I now invite you that are able to stand to turn to page 203 in the red hymnal and sing out, Hail to the Lord's Anointed. Again, it's 203 in the red Methodist hymnal. Thank mm -hmm. you.
Our second scripture reading this morning can be found on page 714 in the Bibles in the pews. We're in the 40th chapter of the book of Isaiah, using verses 1 through 11. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed, that her sin has been paid for, that she is received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice of one calling, in the wilderness prepare the way for the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill made low, the rough ground shall become level, the rugged places a plain, and the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all people will see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice says, cry out. And I said, what shall I cry? All people are like grass, and all their faithfulness is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall because the breath of the Lord blows on them. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of our God endures forever. You who bring good news to Zion... Go up on a high mountain. You who bring good news to Jerusalem, lift up your voice with a shout. Lift it up, do not be afraid. Say to the towns of Judah, here is your God. See the sovereign Lord comes with power and he rules with a mighty arm. See his reward is with him and his recompense accompanies him. He tends his flocks like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms and carries them close to his heart. He gently leads those that have young. This is the word of God for the people of God. God. If you would please join me once again in an attitude of prayer. Loving God, more times than we can count, we have turned away from you, sometimes out of spite or anger, sometimes out of forgetfulness and neglect. But no matter the reason, no matter our stubbornness or silliness, you never give up on us. You continue to walk alongside us, never leaving our side, never letting us stray too far. Your love and grace know no end, and you continue to reach out to us. Now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts together in this place be pleasing in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Be it ever so humble, there's no place like home. That's a reoccurring line from the 19th century song, Home Sweet Home, one that was adapted from American actor and dramatist John Howard Payne's 1823 opera, Clary, or Maiden of of Milan, or if you live that way, Maiden of Milan. The song's melody was composed by Englishman Sir Henry Bishop, with the lyrics coming, of course, from Payne himself. Now, I'll be honest, I first heard that line not in this opera. First time I heard this line, it came out of the mouth of one wascally wabbit, named Bugs Bunny, in the 1953 cartoon short, Upswept Hero. If you have not seen that one, I highly recommend it. It's got to be on YouTube or somewhere. Um, And if not, I'm sure I have a copy I could lend you. This month, using our, our Advent and Christmas sermon series, we're talking about this idea of home. And it can carry, home can carry a lot of different meanings for different people. And we're also kind of trying to look at this concept of where we belong. Now last week, using part of Mark's gospel, we spent some time discussing the end of the world as we know it. And again, not the REM song, although I will tell you I had to fight the temptation to try and sneak a line or two from the song somewhere in the message just to see if anybody would catch it. I did not, but the year's not over. No, instead we we focused on how 
No one but God knows when the world will end, for that matter, how it will end. We also talked about how the world as we know it changes every year, every month, every week, every day, every hour potentially. And, and when Jesus was telling his listeners in that part of Mark's gospel to stay awake, he wasn't trying to make them like worried and concerned. He was trying to tell the people actually not to worry. Stay awake, stay focused. He's trying to tell them they need to be consistent and authentic in their lives, in their faith, and their love. We shouldn't worry about things we have no control over, but we should do something about the things that we do. But why all this talk of home and where we belong during the season of Advent? Shouldn't it simply be home is where you gather with your family for Christmas or Christmas Eve, and isn't that, too, where we belong? Yeah, but the problem with that answer is it's very simplistic, and it doesn't leave, doesn't leave any room for us to consider other definitions of home, including those that are not physical, and it really it leaves out several other places where I think we can claim we belong. One of the most important answers that I can think of when I think about where do we belong is our faith community. We belong here because we are all children of God, siblings with Christ Jesus, and, and hopefully at least, this faith community and every other is a place that feels like home. Now, most of you, I think, by now know that I am not a big fan of camping. I think I've established that fairly well at this point. And yes, I joke about needing access to the internet and electricity, but I am completely serious about my need for running water and clean bathroom facilities. There's no negotiation on that part. But that's really not my only hang-up, if I'm being honest, with you and, and with myself. You see, there's, there's something kind of scary about being in the wilderness. Now, in this instance, I'm talking about physical wilderness. Now, whether that means a dark forest out in an undeveloped piece of land or area of land with forests and a body of water, maybe, or even just the middle of nowhere kind of places that seem empty and desolate and completely lacking of life. I think most of us could come up with a few examples of places that, that fit that kind of description of wilderness. How many abandoned homes still sit in cities like Detroit and Saginaw and other places that have become desolate, lacking life, seemingly forgotten, at least by many? I think part of my own dislike and, and really fear about physical wilderness spaces, especially the forest kind, I think it really comes back to the early fairy tale of Hansel and Gretel. I mean, look at what happened to those poor kids. Their dad dumps them in the middle of the forest and takes off. He doesn't give them, like, food or a tent, a blanket. He just, here you go, and off he goes. And then, if that's not bad enough, these poor kids start going, looking for shelter, some kind of help, and they find this amazing house <clears throat> made out of baked goods. And they're so excited until they meet the person who lives in the house, because she's a witch and she tries to eat them. You can kind of see maybe here as a child, while I wasn't really keen on this idea of wilderness, you ever see a gingerbread house in the forest go the other way? Unless you can run faster than the witch. Although if she's on a broom, I don't know if you have any hope. Anyway, I remember my parents telling me and my sisters that we, should, we shouldn't go into unfamiliar places, 
you know, like a forest, by ourselves or without any kind of resource in which to find our way back. And I don't think they were trying to scare us. I think it was really just more of this is good practical advice on how to stay safe. And as I've grown up and aged, I've lost some of that fear or discomfort with physical wilderness and, you know, places like forests and trails. Or at least I thought I had. Because in, back in 2010, a movie came out that some of you may have seen called 127 Hours. Now, to me, this is a horrifying true tale of a man named Aaron Rayston who was, who was able to survive a canyoneering accident back in 2003 when he was in Utah by cutting off part of his own right arm. You see, what happened while he was hiking in this canyon in the beautiful state of Utah, which Utah is beautiful. If you haven't been there and you have a chance, please go. It is absolutely stunning. And the people are very friendly, at least the ones that I'm out. Um, but this... In this canyon, this boulder he's climbing on, it starts to roll and it pins his right arm against the canyon wall. After about five days of being stuck like this, he breaks his own forearm and he cuts himself free using his multi-tool. Now, you're not likely to find me rock climbing in the canyons of Utah especially at this stage of my life. But that's still really horrifying and scary. He's out literally in the wilderness, has no way to get in touch with anyone, which, if I remember right, was kind of his fault, but still, that just doesn't sound like fun. But then, of course, we also have the theoretical wilderness. The theoretical wilderness, or sorry, yeah, theoretical wilderness in our spiritual, our emotional, and our psychological existence. Those times when, when we're alone, when we're destitute, when we feel as if nothing will work, that nothing can be done about the situation we find ourselves in. That kind of wilderness can actually be even more scary than the physical kind. The internal wilderness of despondency and isolation, doubt and fear, anger and, and wondering. Where, oh where, is God in the midst of all of this? We find ourselves asking, why does it feel like I'm destined to take these paths and trails all alone? Or at least what, what feels like all alone. Because the unfortunate reality is that wandering out in the wilderness typically leads to fear and the unknown. Those are two things we, we tend not to really enjoy very much. Definitely don't embrace them and, and try and sit with them. Fear can make all kinds of messes in us, for us, around us, and the unknown. The unknown means lack of control. And we already know how humans feel about lack of control. In this passage from Isaiah this morning, this was written during a time in Israel's history that was, let's say, intense. What had happened was Israel repeatedly turned away from God and kept breaking the covenant with God that they had made. The prophets at the time were trying to tell the people to warn them to turn from their selfish ways, turn back to God, reestablish the covenant. The prophets stated that if the Israelites did not turn back to God, something bad was going to happen. And when I say bad, I mean really, really bad, catastrophic, apocalyptic kind of bad. And because the people didn't listen to the prophets, 
Something bad did, in fact, happen. That something bad was the Babylonians. The Babylonians not only conquered Jerusalem, they outright destroyed it. And when I say that, they leveled it. Homes, businesses, the temple, crops in the fields, everything. It all went bye-bye. And they were forced to watch this happen, the people of Jerusalem. And if that wasn't bad enough, the Babylonians then carted away many of the Israelites away from their homes and took them, marched them to Babylon. The Israelites were whisked away from a land that they loved and they knew as home. God's people of Israel were in an awful wilderness in a foreign country being held really against their will in a place that they knew really nothing about, a land that wasn't theirs. They had turned away from God and found themselves out in the wilderness. This part of Israel's history kind of, to me, has the same, a similar air as when Adam and Eve were kicked out of the Garden of Eden. In both cases, people turned away from God and soon thereafter found themselves <clears throat> out in the wilderness seemingly alone. Yet, God was still with them. In the case of the Israelites, still with them in the wilderness of Babylon and in their return home eventually. Just as God was still with Adam and Eve outside the garden and was with them as they began their family and began adjusting to life outside of paradise. In the midst of the unknown, the unfamiliar, this, this scary wilderness, God came to the Israelites with words of comfort. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed, that her sin has been paid for, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. The words from Isaiah are not the first time that God has been in the wilderness with the Israelites. We can't forget we have the whole Exodus adventure. That was, of course, when the Israelites were trying to flee Egypt and the rule of Pharaoh. And in the midst of their escape, it was God who, who cleared a path for the Israelites out of Egypt, including the dr dramatic parting of the Red Sea. Even in the midst of their complaining, and let me tell you, the Israelites were amazing complainers. Even in the midst of their complaining, God continued to travel with the Israelites to their new home. But then, as it was known to happen from time to time, as years passed on, the Israelites began to turn away from God and, and they weren't heeding the warnings of their prophets. The Israelites turned away from God and were carted off to Babylon, leaving Jerusalem in ruins. Not only that, but they, they left several people behind. They were separated from their families, their loved ones. Their homes were literally torn apart, as were their families in some cases. Yet God cleared away again and again for the Israelites to return home. Yeah, the Israelites may have turned away from their God before the Babylonian exile. God never abandoned them. This was really a reoccurring theme with the Israelites, and not once did God ever call it quits. God never said, you know what? I'm done. This is getting old. You're on your own. No. Instead, God continued to clear a way out of the wilderness for his people. And in my opinion, at least, 
There's something really interesting about Isaiah's words and the words of Mark's gospel that Fonda read to us before. God is found in the most unexpected places. God isn't just here in this worship space. God's out there. God is out in the wilderness. And even if God's people have royally messed up, God still clears a way home for them. God knows our wilderness. God knows our fears, our worries. God knows the physical wilderness that we might push back against, and God knows the psychological, emotional, and spiritual wilderness we find ourselves in from time to time. And even then, God still clears a way home for us, even today. God knows our wilderness experiences because God has never left us. God is with us every step of our life in our journeys. There is nowhere that God has not been and cannot go. There may be moments when we feel alone, but I promise you, you are not. Sometimes it takes a little bit more effort on our end to, to realize that, to hear God or to feel God's presence. But I promise you, just as God stayed with the Israelites through every step of their journey from Egypt to the Promised Land to Babylon and back, God stands and walks with each and every one of us and never leaves our side. Amen. I'd like to invite you to rise as you are able for our closing hymn number 236, While Shepherds Watched Their Flocks.
Cherished siblings of our Savior Jesus Christ and beloved children of God, the day of the Lord is coming. Therefore, strive to live in peace, for God's salvation is near. And now, faithfulness spring up from the ground, and righteousness look down from heaven as you walk in the way of peace. And may the blessing of God, eternal majesty, living word, and holy comforter be with you now and always. Amen. Thank you.